All right, so we're talking about visual effects. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about like how to do them and, you know, but I'll explain like the different kinds there are and um, some of the different websites you might be able to go to to find some of these different visual effects and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna delve in too deeply into it because it's just so, uh, there's such a wide range of different things that have to be done to, in order to get visual effects to work, depending on what you're trying to do. And even if we explain it, like it would take hours and hours and multiple meetings to break every single individual thing down. Yeah. So some of these things we will just have to like go um, scratch the surface of and then uh, you guys can look more into either with the playlists or particular videos or delve deeper into, you know, that. So the three main kinds of uh, visual effects are CGI, which is computer generated imagery, compositing and motion capture. There's also keying, which is like green screen keying and things like that. Rotoscoping, which is drawing around um, the object that you wanna cut out of the frame. There's paint outs and removals, set extensions, tracking in motion, particle effects and lighting effects. And I'll get a little deeper into those in just a second. Um, for CGI, there's 3D modeling, sculpting, UV unwrapping and texturing, rigging, animation or animating, lighting, simulation physics, rendering, and then compositing. So there's a lot to do just for CGI alone, which is why, and CGI is, I would say that's the main one that, are, that is used all over the place. Um, it is, you know, anytime you're watching any kind of animated movie from Pixar or you're watching a movie which clearly doesn't have a talking lion or a talking animal or something like that, even if it's live action, those are when CGI are used. And so I, I'd say that is the most often used thing. When you are shooting for, for visual effects, for CGI in particular, you want to use um, something like this, used on a lot of sets, which is called an HDRI ball, or um, it's also known as a mirror ball, a light probe, and a chrome ball. And basically what it's doing is you take a picture of it, or you, you have um, a clip of it where you're recording it, and that, that ball, that side that's mirroring it, and the other side that's more of like a, a gray card or a mat. It's showing the direction of the light, how strong the light is, where the light's coming from, and where it's being reflected from. So it's showing the direct light and the reflected light so that when they're making the CGI elements or when they're making visual effects elements later in post-production, they can reference this and um, match the CGI's lighting to the lighting that was on set. So you wanna do this for every different kind of shot. Oh, all right, thanks, Mel. Um, so you do that for every kind of shot and um, that way you're capturing the lighting from that angle so that whenever they put the CGI into it in its place, it's going to look real. It's going to fit with the scene. The light's gonna be coming from the right spot and it's gonna be the right intensity and the right brightness and everything like that. Some common visual effects softwares that you'll come across are Adobe After Effects, of course. That's you know the main consumer one, I would say, for just like basic effects and graphics. Then you get into more complex things like modeling and stuff, where CGI, you come into um, Cinema 4D, and Maxon, Cinema 4D, Autodesk, Maya. There's Synth Eyes. 3DS Max, Houdini, I think it's uh, pronounced Buju or Boju, something like that, B-O-U-J-O-U -O -U for this one. There's Mocha and there's Nuke. Plenty of others, but these are the main ones that are used and the most often, I would say the most often used are probably After Effects, um, Cinema 4D, and maybe Maya or 3DS Max, one of those two, but I've heard of, I've definitely heard a lot more about Cinema 4D and After Effects than any of the rest.
All right. So with CGI, CGI again, it stands for computer generated imagery. CGI can be many things. It can be fire, it can be water, it can be buildings, landscapes, fully animated, photo real animals and people like in screen. Um, and those are usually the most complex things to do is the animals and the people to make them look real, to make them move right. There's a bunch of stuff that has to go into it. So that's probably the most complex type of CGI there is. Um, I would say simulation physics is probably really difficult too, but generally this is the most requested one for CGI whenever you have a movie with animated characters or characters that wouldn't really exist in the real world. You need these CGI creatures and you need them to move realistically, you need them to be lit realistically and to react to things realistically and their performance to come across even though it's animation. And that is where um, all these complex things with CGI come in. You normally with a, on a larger budget, especially if, you, if you're using CGI, you're gonna have several different teams working on it, all on different aspects at the same time for the overall project or in, in steps. So you might have somebody working on the first step, they pass it off and then they work on a new element and they keep doing that over and over again, passing it down the line down that um, pipeline until it's completed. Very rarely would you have one team or one person doing the entire CGI effect all their own, unless it's a lower budget production, then you might just have that, but it will take a lot longer for the same thing to get done, which is why they use multiple people, multiple teams on larger budget productions. There's 3D modeling, which is the first step. It's creating a three-dimensional object in simulated space. A model can be made out of basic shapes or more complex high polygon shapes. So you can see that kind of in this, where it's a little bit more basic on the left, but the more sophisticated it gets, the smaller those little polygons or little squares or triangles get, which uh, makes the overall image have a lot more information, a lot more maneuverability and things like that. Polygon, um, I believe is the triangle and it, I, I guess it can be a four-sided or five-sided as well, but I've only heard of them using like the, the triangle ones because when you put the triangles together, like in this image, you start making different shapes. You can make circles, you can make more complex shapes and geometry by adding a bunch of them together and making them smaller and smaller. As you make them smaller, the smoother the edges will get compared to if you just used a few of them like in the top left, it's going to be, it's not, it's not really going to look like a circle at that point. So you can see, um, I need to open this one. So the more complex it is, obviously the smoother it's going to look and the more detailed it's going to be. And whenever you get into sculpting, which is the next step, it'll give them more maneuverability on what they can adjust instead of adjusting a whole bunch. Like if you pulled from the left and you're trying to make her cheeks bigger, it's going to make, it's gonna pull from a bit more of the face than if you're just pulling from little parts of the polygons on the right. So depending on how, how it was modeled will affect the rest of the steps down the line. And depending on how detailed it needs to be will depend on uh, how many polygons put into it, how detailed and complex that model needs to be. Sculpting is taking what, um, sculpting allows the 3D artist to take what the modeler did and manipulate it and shape it to shape that poly, it's called a polygon mesh, whenever it's uh, those polygons put together into a shape. And it allows them to take that mesh and adjust it as they want, as if it were clay. So the modeler make, make, make the shape of the head, like in this image, and the sculptor is the one making the nose, the wrinkles, the, indent, the uh, little indentures in their cheeks or something for dimples and other things like that to give it a lot more detail. Next you have what's called UV unwrapping in CGI. It's also known as UV mapping. It's taking the 3D image and laying it out into a flat 2D image so that you can add texture to it. Um, 
and then you'll rewrap it around the, the 3D image so that it holds that whatever you put on it. So if you're putting somebody's face, you're gonna put it flat and then you're gonna put their face on it and then it's gonna wrap back around the 3D image. Not exactly sure why this needs to be done, but for some reason it, it does. It has to be unwrapped first because 2D is the way to place the layers on top. And then it just goes back into the 3D image. So you can't really just put it over the 3D like you can uh, if you were painting a sculpture, you have, to, you have to break it down into a 2D image first or UV unwrap it and then put the layer, the texture on it and then wrap it back around onto the subject again or the uh, character or whatever you want to call it. It's kind of like this. You have a 3D model of a planet. You unwrap it so that it's just flat square like a map. UV mapping is why it's called that. Um, and then you're going to put the texture over it, which is which looks like that, put it back on, and you wrap it back around the 3D. And now the image is wrapped around and it looks a little 3D. It looks like there's different, um, it's not as 2D as the as the flat image, obviously. It has curves, it has different lighting elements to it, which is making it look 3D to us. It has X, Y, and Z coordinates. The reason why it's called UV is basically it's just the um, X coordinate and the Y coordinate, but they didn't want to use X and Y because that was already used in the model itself. The model has an X, Y, and Z coordinate. And so they used UV coordinates instead. But basically what it is is just the X axis and the Y axis, the horizontal and the vertical axis, which, you know, that's what made it, 2D is made out of. Next, you have what's called rigging. And so if you're making a creature, you're making a person, or you're making an object that needs to move around, you are going to make its bone structure. So in this instance, they're giving it a bone structure, a skeletal structure for the human. Um, and that way, whenever the animators take it from there and they try to animate it, they can make the movements do what they want, it doesn't take as long and they'll, it'll react as if it were a skeleton because the skeleton's all connected. So it'll look more realistic as if it were our skeleton, our skeletal system. And that way you can animate it, making the movements to make it match whatever you need to. The model in the middle, the end at the, I mean the final at the, the final render at the left and the rigging system, the bone structure on the right. And you can see that you can start moving things around and it's gonna react differently now that it has a bone structure than it would if it was just a big ball of clay, like when you were sculpting it. Now the mouth reacts to certain parts of the skeletal system that the rigging team made. Can I just say, <laughs> just, yeah. It does look really good. Really <laughs> And then, when, and then the uh, animators take it, they, mo they take the, the model, the sculpture, the rig all together, and they can form the digital object or character and make them moving and reacting realistically, giving them emotion and creating the final animated project or the uh, render for it. Well, I guess not the render, hold on. We'll get into render in a second. That's the last step. So unlike animation, the difference between animation and rigging is rigging is extremely technical. You often have to create custom controls to be able to allow them to move certain things. You saw that in this image, all those little green circles, light blue circles, red circles, they're all gonna control different parts of the face. So the facial animations will be different based on which part of that you grab and adjust and move. And so they do the custom controls, muscle systems, and more in order to provide the animators with what they need to move the characters around. Because without the riggers, the animators wouldn't be able to bring the objects to life, and you wouldn't look like they're reacting to things, shaking their head, grabbing a ball, or whatever else. Next, this is sort of a 
not it's, it's, if you're just creating a character, you're probably not going to use this, but this is a different aspect of CGI. Um, simulation physics. Simulation physics is using like complex physics and mathematics to simulate things happening realistically. So from explosions, buildings crumbling or toys or whatever this is supposed to be on the screen. I would say it's supposed to be toys, but maybe it's something else. Um, it's uh, to ripples in a pond or a coin falling to a ground or even an apple being bit into. All of these things need to be simulated realistically so that they um, react realistically, fall at the right speed, bend at the right spot. So when the apple's getting bit into, part of the apple's going to bend where the tooth imprints are going, even if that's not the part that gets bit off. The coin that's falling, how heavy is that coin? How fast would it realistically fall? All of those things have to go into simulation physics. Sometimes if you get the math wrong, or even if you have the math exactly right, for whatever reason, it doesn't, it, it doesn't react exactly realistically. I saw this when I was watching a behind the scenes thing on The Hobbit, when I think it was the, the second one, when they were in the, um, the throne room of the dwarves with all the gold. So they tried to make sure that the gold coins would react realistically using simulation physics. They had all the math right, or so they claimed, uh, and said, you know, they, this is how the gold would react. Peter Jackson told them that it seemed like it was falling too smoothly, it was falling too fast, it seemed more liquid than it should. And so they actually had realist, real gold coins for the movie to like sprinkle on top of the other ones to, to make it look real. And uh, they basically grabbed them all up and used it and saw that, oh, never mind, the simulation is off for whatever reason. It, it doesn't react that liquidy, that it doesn't fall that smoothly. It, it stops, it doesn't keep going down like, a, like it's sliding down a slip and slide. It, it stops on each other because they're gold coins. So they react a little differently. And so then they adjusted it. But usually with simulation physics, you can get really close, if not perfect, to what it would do in real life. You just have to make sure that your math is right and you have to take into account all these different things. Like maybe they didn't take into account how heavy gold coins are or how a gold coin reacts to another gold coin when it's sliding across it. Maybe that's different than if it was gliding across silver or another metal. You never know. So those types of things you have to take into account and that's why simulation physics and CGI is so difficult and so complex and uh, a separate thing entirely. But without it, things just wouldn't look or feel real whenever we see them uh, move. If you see this water go in, you know, you're going to see, is it realistic looking? Is it not? If they don't have it react real realistically, if they don't have that pond, that little ripple go in the right spot in the right way, like how it would in real life we're not gonna really know what's wrong with it, but we're going to know something is wrong. And sometimes water might stay on top of the other water. So, you know, like different reasons for different things, um, which they have to do a bunch of tests for and figure out what's the best way to show this certain thing happening to make it look real and feel real. And then you have lighting lighting effects for CGI, which if you didn't light them in the proper way, this is why that UV ball is, is used. But if you're doing an animation, you just have to know where the light's coming from. Because if you didn't, if you didn't adjust the lighting at all, it's just going to look very dull and plain and look kind of like clay or plastic. Whereas if you add that lighting, lighting is really what makes it look realistic, makes it look more like skin, makes it look more like they're outside or they're in front of a computer screen, like in this instance, and uh, it just affects the entire image. So before you have nothing, you just have like this, you have where the light's coming from, you can see it on the kid. You can see there's some light coming from over towards the right of screen, but um, it just doesn't look the same as, it just doesn't look as, as real as when they add in the light effects and adjust it to make it look more realistic as if he were actually there. With global illumination on and off, you can see they look a lot fake, more fake on the top and they look a lot more realistic on the bottom. Going back for like Toy Story from Pixar, their first animations, 
um, some of their first anyway, Toy Story 1 to Toy Story 4. You can see Bo Peep was supposed to be a glass doll. And uh, in, the, in the one in 2000 and, well, 1995, the first one, Toy Story 1, uh, she looks a lot more plastic. She doesn't look very glass-like. The bottom of her looks a little shiny, but it's not, it doesn't nearly look as good as the one on the right where they've adjusted the lighting, the reflection to make it look more like how a glass object reacts to light in those certain lighting conditions. And there's lighting again, just with different effects, giving it different looks and showing the before and after, top left without it, top bottom right with it, makes all the difference. Uh, and then we have a, so after you're done with either the, um, Create, like creating the model, doing the animation and all of that. You have to do the rendering, which is the process of putting all the work together so that it's in one, one file, pretty much, so that it's not all separated. Um, and so rendering takes a long time, especially for animation, because there's so much different things going on that it has to piece together to make one image, that uh, it can take a huge farm of computers for a, a Pixar movie to be made. and that can still take a while long to, to render fully. So as these are getting created, as these assets are getting made, they're getting rendered out so that they can be put together later and then re-rendered again after they're composited. Compositing, like in this image, is basically like whenever you have a green screen or you're, um, or you are rotoscoping something out and you're going to replace the background, you're going to put something in the foreground, you're adding a layer to it, you're compositing. Anytime you use green screen, you're gonna be compositing because you're gonna be adding a layer to the background to make it look like they're somewhere else. And that's all compositing is. It's just taking different elements, putting them all into one image and combining them. So you might have a rendered CGI object, a ball, and you might have the rendered dog. And when the dog bites into the ball, you're doing the animation for it and everything. And then you're putting the ball and the dog together into one, you're compositing them together and you're doing the final render to get them completed. Compositing can also be done without CGI though, <clears throat> like with green screen and live action footage like that. So it's not just, or anytime you add a visual effect over the top, that's also considered compositing because you're adding another layer. So that's all that means. You can see in this image, taking different things, taking different backgrounds, and it makes it look like they're in different areas. The sky's bluer on the right, or he's farther away on the left, taking that model, taking the background, putting them together, composite. Here you can see like what it does whenever you're doing green screen, you're doing a mat, so the white part's saying, here, keep this, kick out the rest that's black, and then put in this different background, and then your final key is all of it together without the uh, green screen in it. More complex things, of course, are gonna have more layers. So the more stuff you're trying to do, the more layers of things you're going to need, the more complex it gets and the longer it takes to render later because it's a bunch of different objects being put together into one. <coughs> Excuse me. With motion capture or mocap, it's the process of recording the movement of objects or people to capture their performance and physical movements. This will usually be done in combination with the other steps in the CGI process. So animators and visual effects artists have a reference and they can either use the mocap and just make adjustments to it and actually like put the actor's performance into the facial expressions of whatever the in this case, the dragon and, and a hobbit. They can uh, use what Benedict Cumberbatch was doing with his face and try to adjust the dragon's reactions the same way if they want. Or they can just use it as a reference point and create their own movement completely from scratch as they would if they were making an animated movie without any kind of mocap.
whenever you're doing mocap, you have to wear a mocap suit, which is what you see him wearing, Andy Circus. And um, they actually used his facial expressions and stuff to match it to Gollum. So they kind of just used that and just uh, had, a, had a better starting point than they would if they had started from scratch. Whereas compared to uh, this one, I would say they used it sort of, but they used more of his movements, his head like moving from side to side rather than just copying his mouth and uh, his expressions because a dragon's face and structure and bone structure would be different so it wouldn't react exactly the same way as a human's face so it wouldn't look right if they copied it verbatim like they did sort of with Andy Circus because Gollum's a little bit more human-like his features are a lot more like ours And like I said, green screen, you got keying, which is taking that green and just telling the computer, hey, take this color out. It doesn't have to be green, it can be any color. Um, but you're basically, when you're keying, you are just telling the computer to take away a certain color from the entire image and making it transparent or see-through so that you can put another image underneath. Like I said, you have rotoscoping next, which if your green screen is messing up or um, you didn't have a green screen at all, but you still wanna cut the person out of that image and put them into another space, you would have to use rotoscoping, which is just hand drawing a uh, shape around whatever you're trying to cut. So in this case, a person, so you have to draw an outline of that person so that you cut her out from the background and can replace the background later. Like this case, there was no green screen, so they had to remove the, the person so it looked like the teddy bear is walking on its own. They had to rotoscope around the teddy bear and kick out the person, pretty much. Next, you have um, what's called paint outs or removals. And it's taking out certain parts of the image and replacing it to make it look like that part was never there. So wire removal, or removing lights, like in this example. Um, those are really common as well as sky replacement. You know, if you, somebody, if you see a sky and you're trying to make it either day for night or you're trying to just make it an alien planet, you might just take the sky, replace it with a different image that you've created or found or whatever to make it look like it's a different split, space, yeah, space. Or if you have people close by and you're trying to get a shot and it's a really tight quarters, but you wanna make sure the audio is really good, you might have the sound guy stick with them and then just key them out later or uh, remove them later. And there's a two ways to do this mainly, which we'll get into in just a second. First of all, you wanna have a clean plate. If you are trying to remove something from an image, Having a clean plate just means you are having the image without the subject in it. So if you, let's say we were recording this guy here in the brick, we would have him not be in the frame and shoot the, the shot so that it stays, we have that image without anybody in it. And then we'd reshoot it with the guy and then we would cut the guy out and replace this side of the right side of the image with the clean plate, the one that didn't have anybody in it. That way it matches perfectly. And um, we remove him easily without having to do anything else. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Like all the like the editing and Photoshop tricks that you can do, it is quite limitless. It's very interesting and cool. Yeah, yeah, the real, the only limit really is just time. But if you actually learn all of this stuff and you, you take the time to know it and everything, or you have somebody that's willing to do it, as long as you're willing to spend the time doing it, you can pretty much create whatever you want. Yeah, no, it's actually really cool. That's like why I like film so much. Um, just cause like it is, 
the two reasons one because it's limitless the amount of stories and things that you can create and then the other one is like it's you can do it all yourself but that's lame it's like fun actually doing it with everybody yeah i would say the only re the reason why you have to do it by yourself mostly is because budget <laughs> but yeah i agree um it well, is no, better when you have people you but you usually have to have the budget for it if if you don't have volunteers and things like that well, if you're working on somebody else's projects or whatever, I don't know. Like, I don't like to like look at like being limited by money and stuff. That's kind of like bad. So it's better to have co collaboration and like getting really good at what you do and working with everyone is way more fun. I mean, mm -hmm. than even trying to like, even like people that have money don't want like lots of money don't necessarily want to only create their own stuff. They want to work on other people's projects because it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. We just mean like in the sense of like, money is going to be a factor you have to consider in certain cases and so in that well, of course, it's always a factor you have to consider that in anything even if you're working for somebody else and it's their budget you know you have to consider you know the tools materials whatever regardless yeah, yeah. all right um there's also so there's the uh the Depending there's that way, the clean plate way, where you, you record the thing, you have the person there, and then you just cut them out and replace it with the background of the image. If you're doing any kind of camera movement with this, you have to make sure that it's exact, which is usually having to use some kind of mechanized or motorized um, dolly or slider or whatever movement you're doing. You have to make sure that it matches exactly so that you can just replace it by cutting out the person and putting the other image underneath. If you aren't doing any camera movement, you don't really have to worry about that. But um, if you are, you have to make sure it is precise and exact or it's not gonna match up and it's gonna look weird. So the other way to do it is using a clone stamp tool, something like this, where you can paint around something that you want to remove. You can adjust it and it's kind of copying the pixels next to it. And as long as you do it smoothly, you will be able to get rid of pretty much anything um, and replace it with pixels that look like they should be there, even if they really weren't there before. I love that tool, Clone Stamp. I use it yeah. often. It's so fun. It's so easy. Once you get good at it, like it takes a minute to like understand, like, cause like it doesn't always like if you use Clone Stamp, it doesn't always like actually like copy exactly where the Clone Stamp is. Like it's like mm -hmm. around it, like the circle. It's like the area kind of like hovering above, and then it kind of goes in. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. So you have to make sure that like, however, if it gets more complex, if there's things you don't want to copy around it, you have to be really more precise and kind of zoom in on it, make the little yeah, things. Yeah, just zoom in and change the size. Yeah, change the size of the tool. Yeah. And that way you can get more precise with it. And if you can do that, you can remove something. Let me open this. You can remove something a little bit more complex like this and make it look like it was never even there in the first place. You know, it doesn't look like those trees aren't messed up. It doesn't look like a copy, even though it is. We know that because it's, you know, we obviously, we know that because we're demonstrating it, but, you know, it's, it's not entirely noticeable. Unless you look very closely, you can kind of see, oh, it's copying this side right here. But if you're doing a shot, if you're doing a scene, you know, if you're, if you're quickly going by these kinds of things, or if there's any kind of movement, Nobody's going to really be paying that much attention to be able to notice it unless you've done it in a uh, very quick, sloppy way. If you've been precise and you've kind of copied it, they do well, the same thing with, they do it with um, my thinking armies is and stuff like that in films. You know, they don't actually have 500,000 people. They have like 50 and then they just copy them over and over again. Not necessarily using paint, but it's the same concept. Oh yeah, and like that's the thing. Like you want to take your time, like the first few times you do it, because like if you take your time and do it right, it's weird what it does to your brain. But magically, you just start like able to do it faster without even mm -hmm. trying. Like it just becomes easier instead yeah. of trying to do it like the driving. Other way. Yeah, instead of trying to do it the other way, where you try to like do it fast but sloppy, you never get better. It's better to take your time, do it right, and then you now you've done it right, and then you do it fast. So now mm -hmm. you're doing it right and fast, and it's brilliant, and it feels great. That's yeah. my two cents. Yeah. I don't know if it was wanted, but whatever. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, and the next thing you have when you're talking about visual effects is what's called set extensions, digital backdrops. They're used in a live action set piece to make it look larger or to change the background. This can either be done with a green screen, like in the image right now, or without. I think I actually have a demonstration of without. So without, they have to kind of do the same thing as you would when you're rotoscoping. You have to rotoscope around the person and make a mat, cut out the background and replace it with the new background that you want. So you can make somebody look like they're in the city or you can just extend the background. If you have a set piece, like they have this building, which kind of gives the same feel of what might be there, but they want to make it look more extravagant, more like a um, period piece and stuff like that. So they added a, they replaced the building, everything behind the green screen, they replaced with um, the city the fake city that's not really there. Or if you want to make it look like somebody's in a city, you'll add, you know, maybe a few pieces of foreground elements so the actors and people have something to interact with. They can kind of get a feel of where they are. You have that light above it that looks sort of like they're going into a theater, but the rest of it's just green screen and then it gets keyed out and the whole thing's replaced with the backdrop, digital set extension, which makes it look like it's in that city. Again, same things used here. They have a little bit of foreground element. The set piece is pretty good here. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me actually open this so I can zoom in. So the set piece is pretty good. It gets them, it get, get, we'll get the actors the feel of uh, where they are, you know, what they're doing, where they're coming from. But they, didn't, they don't have the resources to build the entire thing. So of course you just add a green screen into the spots that you need to replace. And then you replace it later on with what you had in, or what the director has in mind for the uh, image. Again, same thing. Looks like they're in a desert or they're in a place, but really they're not. So they just add a few foreground elements, some production design elements for the actors they interact cool. with. Yeah, it and looks like it's like- background entirely. It's cheating and stuff, but it's not because it's still like a ton of work and like the foreground, like it makes like when it's a real foreground, it makes it look realistic because like the background, it's easy to paint the background and have it like look like you're actually there in like not in studio. Yeah, especially yeah. because like with the background, most of the time they're not really focused on it. You have it blurred out sort of, you know, like how you would if you were really shooting it. And so uh, they don't really have to do as much with the background anyway. Mm -hmm. So it just saves a lot of money to, to sometimes just to put up a green screen and, and then use a digital set extension later. Yeah, it makes sense. Like it's always, you always want to like balance it out. Like you don't want to cheap out on stuff, but you also don't want to be like wasting, you know, all of your budget either. So you got to be sure that you're like balancing it. Right. Which is awesome when they do studio stuff like this. Cause it's smart. Cause like to film this on location would be, a lot hard. more money because they have to go into a desert. They have to fly from everybody there, everybody up. Yeah, it becomes right. like a huge thing. And in here, it could have just been in a studio, or it could be in an outdoor lot, or something like that. And they just put up the green screen to make it look like it's somewhere else. Yeah, no, film stuff's so cool. And it's like, it's fun to do all the, the, the cheat stuff too. And then it's also fun to go on location as well, like for fun shoots. Like if you're doing, say, like, a movie that's a very small crew, then it would be fun to travel. But like, if you've got like a huge crew doing studio stuff, makes sense. Depending yeah. on what you're like set yeah, up. Yeah, and sometimes you'll have like two units. Depending on how big the budget is, you might have two units. One goes somewhere for else, somewhere else for location shots, and some stay on set. Yeah. On, in the studio area, kind of doing that. Yeah, no, it's good. All right, the next thing we have when we're talking about visual effects is tracking and motion graphics. So that's following a graphic that you're putting into the thing, following camera movement or following movement within the frame. So in this case, it's sticking to something on the ground. So when the camera's moving and panning to the left, that uh, NYC title is going to go to the right. It's not going to stick in the bottom right part of the screen and stay there the whole time because it is connected to something in the frame that is telling it to move to the right of screen. It's probably connected to that yellow line. 
you know, and saying this yellow line, follow it. If it starts to go away, you follow the movement of that yellow line. You can also attach something to, they could have attached it to the person and then it would look like the logo is dragging along with the person as they're moving in frame. And if they ran away towards the bus in the background, the New York logo might follow it. The NYC, I mean, title might follow it towards the background because it's attached to it, motion graphics. Very cool. So it could be like smoke coming from a fire or you know a fake fire and uh, the smoke and the fire are attached to a certain part of screen. This is used when you're moving the camera, um, any kind of camera movement, you wanna make sure that the visual elements stay in certain spots of frame, or you want them to follow along. Maybe you want the title to follow with the, a bus that drives by. So then you would attach it to the bus and let it follow along That's motion, motion graphics and tracking. In this instance, you can see that on his hand, he has that little indicator, which makes the, computer easily be able to follow that because it is different from everything else in frame. And so it's tracking it. And after it's done tracking it, you can see all the movement that has happened with that line that appears, showing that each frame, this is where it was at. And so obviously the more, the longer you're motion tracking an element, the more the computer is doing, the more it's figuring out where that element is and the more complex it is, making it longer to render and um, more complex and um, harder for your computer to, to process. After that, you have particle effects and particle emitters. And that's just for complex animated effects that have many different parts like rain, dust, smoke, and fire. I think Mel talked about this before where in animation, hair is often a really hard thing to do, right? Because there's so many individual strands of hair that if you're trying to realistically make movement with hair, it's very difficult for a computer to do because there's so many different things it needs to keep track of and simulate. And so particle effects and particle emitters sometimes will have like presets that kind of group things together, making it a little bit easier on a computer to be able to handle all of that different information so that it's not actually all individual like it would be in real life, but it still appears that way to us and we can't really tell the difference. Snow, any kind of weather is usually, if it's CGI or animated, it, uh, you usually use particle effects. Video games, I think, do it too. So it's anything that's kind of see through or just has a bunch of different movement because it has so much it has to keep track of and so many different parts moving at once um, that take up a lot of uh, processing power. Sites like Action FX, Footage Crate, Video Copilot, and more like that have assets of visual effects, which are just like presets and visual effects stock footage that allow you to use them in your films and kind of just adjust the color and things so that you already have a preset visual effect. It makes it a bit easier, especially on lower budget productions um, so that you don't have to always start from scratch on everything. So lower budget productions can start with a pre-made effect and adjust it as necessary for their project or their film. Does anyone have any questions, comments, anything to add about any of that stuff, visual effects, any of the stuff we went over. All right, next thing I'm talking about, uh, post-production budget. We didn't really come across any, like too much new information, so it's not really too long. Um, we already talked in depth about budget earlier in the semester. So I'll just go over a few brief things. <clears throat> Obviously, a one way to keep your post-production budget down is what Sarah was talking about earlier, is, is doing the stuff yourself if you can. You know, the problem with that, though, is it'll take a lot longer to get everything done. And unless you know what you're doing and are proficient with it, it's not going to turn out as good as if you were hiring somebody who has experience and expertise in that field. 
However, the more work you can do, the less it's gonna cost you to, to hire somebody. So if you look through the footage and you take out the unusable clips or mess ups, or at least separate them into their own bin, and you listen through the audio and do the same. So you take out the audio that's messed up or that's unusable or separate them into their own bin if you wanna give it to the, the editor still, just in case. Um, syncing the video with the audio and organizing and naming files. Also, if you find, if you need a digital, um, a visual effects artist, if you find the digital assets yourself first, like if you're gonna use one of these, these uh, sites with the stock footage to find the, the effect that works for your project, that way your visual effects crew will not need to do that themselves. You'll save a lot of time for them, which means it's gonna be cheaper for you. For music, if you're going to use a royalty-free track, like a for like stock music, stock footage music, pretty much, <clears throat> stock audio, I don't know what to call it, but basically if you're trying to get music, there are sites that have royalty-free tracks where you pay a, either a subscription or for a one-time fee to get those tracks. So if you were planning to do that anyway, even if you hire someone and you were planning to have them find a music track for you. If you instead take the time to look for it yourself and you find the music or an option or two that might work and then hire the person, you'll be saving them a lot of time and effort and uh, work to do to find that music. So then you can pay them less because their job is now easier. So you're not paying for as much work. Basically, the more work you can take on yourself, the less you'll need to pay someone else because the less work they will have to do. Does anyone have any questions, comments, anything about, on that? No, it makes sense. But oftentimes, like you think of these kinds of things, but like you're rarely going to be using your own budget unless like you're doing like a micro project because let's be real, like, that's why they have teams of like a hundred people, even on like, you know, indies and stuff. It's not like you and you have like, it's all done up and like production costs comes from like a production building budget. It's not like usually personal um, from what I know, but I mean, you know, you still have to take into account and make sure that like, if you're the one who's organizing the budget for each section of like film. So that would usually be like the key of each department It's going to be organizing the but So like each department will get a certain amount of budget to make sure it gets done right. And then you'll be the one organizing it and you have to make sure it gets done. Yeah, we're, I'm talking about more like independent projects where you're making it yourself. Um, so like micro, I micro, like not just micro, there's independent projects that are higher budget as well. They just don't have the whole studio and as many crew members. They're lower oh, budget, budget, but they're not micro budget. There's still, there's levels and tiers to it. Yeah, where, that's true. Where they still have like, if, if me and Priscilla were gonna go make a feature film or something, and somehow we had enough money to do like a $2 million budget, that's still very low budget. It's not micro budget, but it's still very low budget. And uh, so we're not gonna have the same resources as we would with a full studio backed feature film, yeah, Hollywood style movie. So, you know, if we can take on as much work as we can, or if, if we're able to, if we want to, then we can save some money in the post-production budget by doing some of that stuff ourselves. Even if we have a budget of $2 million, we might still wanna do that to save money in post so that we can spend more on pre-production, post-production or production and uh, different crew and things like that. No, that makes sense. All right, so we're moving on from now. We're gonna talk about glide cams, gimbal, gimbals, gimbals, gimbals and steady cams. So yeah. glide cams, gimbals and steady cams are all different camera stabilizers. They help stabilize the footage, make it less shaky, um, make it more fluid and things like that. Glide cams and steady cams are companies that make stabilizers. So you might hear a glide cam, but it might not actually be from that company because that is just the name that people give that kind of 
system now because they are the first ones who came out with it, I think, or the most popular anyway. Same thing with Steadicam. <clears throat> Steadicam, you'll get people talking about them, but they are, um, well, let me just show it. So with, uh, with glide cams, that's like in the image right here, you might have a different brand that makes it, but it's still going to look very similar to that. You'll still have somebody call it a glide cam, even if it's from a different brand like fly cam or another one that makes similar um, stabilizers. With gimbals, gimbals are different brands. Gimbals aren't the name of a company, so they, you'll have different brands, different names for those. If you're going to get a gimbal, you'll know different. You'll have to look into different brands to uh, find the one that best suits you. There are these handheld type ones that are a little bit smaller. They're more like the glide cam, where it's kind of handheld. You hold it with one hand, you turn it with the other. So it's a little bit more like that. But they are battery operated and motorized gimbals, whereas glide cams and steady cams are mechanized and manual stabilizers. So they don't have batteries, they don't have electronics, they just have, they use a weight and gravity to stabilize the camera, whereas a gimbal will use motorized motors and electronics to balance out the, the image, the camera. But yeah, so with gimbals, you have the handheld type like this, and then you have the larger, wider type kind of like this. The wider, bigger ones usually have a little bit more functionality than the little handheld ones. Um, and they're also battery operated, but they're not as small. They don't have as much of that. Uh, they don't have, they're, they're not as simple and as light as these uh, smaller ones. They're a little bit more complex and harder to use. And then you have steady cams like this, which are the most expensive, and they're used on professional sets that require an actual steady cam operator, which come with a vest system, an arm that attaches to the um, the, uh, the the I don't know what you call it actually. I think it's a it's kind of like if you attached a, something similar to a glide cam, where it has weights, an arm, the camera where the camera sits. And that attaches to the arm, which attaches to the vest, and the vest goes on the person that is operating it. All three of those things help to make it fluid, smooth, and uh, not have too much shake to it. But both glide cam and steady cam are mechanized. And steady cams, there might be different brands, but um, steady cam was the first one that came out. And so if you have one that looks or acts like this, people will call it a steady cam. So if you get a, a glide cam, it might not be that brand. Um, so make sure that if you actually want a legitimate glide cam from glide cam, you get one that comes from that brand. Same thing with steady cam. Steady cam is a brand, but everybody just calls these devices steady cams now because they're the most prominent, the most popular, and the first ones that came out with it. So the glide cam doesn't have a bodysuit or an arm for one, for one of their options, but um, I, I know that newer ones have started to have it. So they kind of compare to steady cams in a way. Steady cams and glide cams can be comparable, sort of, but steady cams are, to me anyway, they're going to be more um, professional. They're just going to work better for what you need but they are gonna be a lot more expensive and more difficult to use. So with any, with any stabilizer, it's going to be correcting movement on different axes. So you have a two axis stabilizer that corrects for the, pit, the pitch or the tilt. You know, if you're moving the camera, if you're turning the camera up and down to look down at the ground and then up at the sky, that's the pitch or the tilt. And then roll, which is if you were turning it around in a circle. Uh, actually, let me show you this image. There we go. So if we're turning the camera upside down 
or turn on its side, we're rolling it. If we are turning the camera up towards the sky or down towards the ground, we are using the pitch or tilting it as we know it when we're talking about camera movement. And so a two axis stabilizer will correct for the movement from the roll and the tilt, or it'll correct for the pan and the tilt. Um, you have to look into it. Most of them will correct for, for the tilt and the roll movements so that if you accidentally roll it at all, or if you accidentally um, shift it up or down to, to make it tilt a little bit, it's going to correct it to make sure that those two don't, um, that it stays stable like that. But if you turn it from side to side, it will turn that way. It'll pan or yaw, as it's called in here. So you have to know which, uh, which two axes the stabilizer is compensating for to know what it's going to be doing. Because if it does pan and tilt, then it's doing the uh, pitch and yaw, it's correcting for those. So it's correcting for up and down and side to side movement that you don't want, but it's not correcting for any kind of roll. So it might have a little bit of like a, the, I don't know what to call it, like a teeter totter kind of look to it in a way, if you're moving a lot. But then you have the three axis stabilizer, which corrects for pan, tilt, and roll. Or if you look at it, it says pitch, yaw, and roll. So those are the three. It's kind of like if we're talking about a, a plane, they talk in those terms as well. But if we're talking camera movement, from a cinematographer point of view, we're talking pan, tilt, and roll. So a three axis stabilizer will adjust for those three movements, any kind of uh, movement you're, you're not trying to do, but anytime you're walking or you're moving or you're turning, you're always doing some slight movement. And you can see this when somebody's using a handheld camera and they're not using any kind of stabilization, there's a lot of movement in the frame because there's little Every time they breathe, every time they walk, every time they take a step, it's moving that camera around a little bit. And so these stabilizers try to adjust for all of those things to make sure that it stays stable, it stays, the frame stays still, and it's not moving around all over the place and being jerky and, and uh, ugly. There's also a five axis stabilizer, a uh, gimbal which corrects for pan, tilt, roll, vertical movement, and horizontal movement. Where vertical movement would be like the bobbing up and down every time you take a step when you're walking, or if you're going up steps or down steps, you are lowering and raising yourself so the camera's going up and down just slightly. So it's not the same as the um, pitch, or the tilt, because that's actually turning the camera to look up, turning the camera to look down. It's correcting for the vertical movement, which is just the camera looking straight ahead, but bobbing up and down as if it were in a water with a wave going by. So it's like up and down bobbing. So it's correcting for that. And it's also correcting for any horizontal movement accidentally, like if you were shaking your head, no. It's correcting for that movement for the camera. Or sorry, not shaking your head. No, that would be the uh, that would be panning. The horizontal movement is is correcting for if you are accidentally going side to side with your movements at all. It's not going to adjust it. So five axes will adjust for pretty much everything and make it stable and stay locked in place on whatever you are trying to look at. And it will just go for it will, your the camera will move with you moving, but it won't. Um, it'll. You know, if you're walking toward a subject, obviously the camera's getting closer and the subject's going to look larger and larger as you get closer. But it's not going to have any kind of panning, tilting, rolling, or any kind of bobbing up and down or bobbing side to side. The most common <clears throat> gimbals and things like that are the three axis correcting ones, though, the ones that correct for these three movements so that there's no. Um, unwanted tilting, panning, or rolling within the frame.
So with any of these, you wanna be sure that you can support the weight of your camera with all the accessories attached because some models of these different stabilizers are designed for lighter mirrorless cameras because they're a lot lighter than the, these other ones. Some are for DSLRs, which are a bit heavier, a little bit bigger. And some are designed for the heavier cinema cameras, which can be 20, 40 pounds, you know, can be somewhere within that range. So different gimbals, different glide cams and steady cams will be for different weights, different amounts of weight. Their payload is uh, what determines how much they can hold. Gimbals especially are mainly for DSLRs and mirrorless, but they have started coming out with some recently or within the past year or two, or I don't know, however many years, um, where they are making them now for larger camera loads. So for those big cinema cameras and things like that. But when they first came out, they were more for mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, because those are a lot lighter. And it was easier to have these, uh, fun these motorized functions work with them. Whereas the glide cams and the steady cams and the, the, the manual ones, they're especially steady cams, they're more made for heavier cameras. And so are the glide cams. Um, well, some of them, some of the glide cams can be for lighter cameras and some are for heavier. So that's kind of a range. But with a steady cam, especially, those are more for professional use. And so they're more for heavy cinema cameras. And they won't work, they actually won't work as well with a light camera because they're not made for that. They need that weight to distribute. Um, to balance. And so you always need to pay attention to that as well, which we'll get into in just a second. Having a camera stabilizer like makes your shots so much better. It works so well. Like it's, you know, if you're gonna be doing lots of shooting, I think like totally investing in like, it's like having the camera is good, but without like any stabilizer or tripod or anything, you're not gonna get the best shots. You need honestly, for miniature shoots, in my opinion, you need at least like a tripod and a stabilizer because you need the stabilizer for movement shots. And then um, for any kind of like static shots that you're doing where you want no movement at all, it has to be like propped. I and agree because any kind of movement, like with a handheld motion, if you're just holding it with your hands, you're going to see a lot of shake, a lot of movement that you don't want. It's going to cheapen yeah. the production value. And so, yeah, stabilizers are definitely, in my opinion, they're definitely a lot better. If you do want camera shake, you can always add a bit to it with the stabilization. So it's not as cheap looking. It's more of a professional shake, which yeah. is, what, you know, Hollywood movies and things like that do. But yeah, I, I completely gonna, agree. They use even make bigger, they use tracks and they use like even bigger equipment, like on like the big shoots. But even then, if you want to like shoot, like, unless you're just doing personal use, like if you're actually starting up and you like want to shoot like a whole bunch of like videos, music videos, um you know club videos whatever you're doing you definitely want to invest in like the proper like um supporting equipment along with like the because just having the camera is like good but you need the lenses too right mm -hmm. and everything it's like it's quite a bit of an investment for your personal use but i mean it's good and then yeah. you can shoot lots of stuff and it's fun and you can um, always rent one if you if you can't afford to buy one straight out you can always rent yeah one like that's what i'm saying unless you're like if you're doing a one-off shoot do not buy stuff like, it doesn't make sense. I'm saying if, like, you were working five days a week with your own business running shoots, then, yeah, you're going to need your own gear. Yeah. You, so that's, it depends what you do, like, for instance, or, like, every weekend you're shooting stuff. Okay, then you're going to need your own gear. Um, if you're just shooting, like, uh, <clears throat> what's it called? If you're just shooting, you know, again, like, a video for, like, that we're building here once a year, it's more cost-effective to rent. Mm -hmm. so yeah again like it depends where you're at yeah definitely and, and it depends on how often you plan to use the equipment yeah and if you have a team, or, or rent it yeah and if you have a team then you want to have like your own storage facility with all the basic like if i was running it if i say had like was running like videos all the time you'd want to have like a storage compartment and have like sound gear camera gear everything like on the smaller level like this is like if you're running an independent production versus if you're like running because like you're not going to do that on a huge hollywood budget production because like the equipment's not going to fit but it's huge right but yeah. like if it's like running an independent like you know 
videos where you're like shooting like features but they're like independent then yeah you'd probably want to have your own like rent house and then you could rent specialized gear you'll mm -hmm. save a lot on like rentals over the long haul if you're doing it for like five years plus mm -hmm. this is just thoughts yeah definitely anyway, all right um so with glide cams they are a lot cheaper usually than uh gimbals or steady cams steady cams are really expensive they can go up to like 40 to fifty thousand. i think sixty thousand and more depending on what what which one you get so clearly you know they are a huge investment and I think the, again they're the most difficult to learn and things like that so they're often not really talked about as often with most people because the majority of people don't have that kind of money to buy it so those are usually held off for bigger budget productions when somebody knows what they're doing and are an actual steady cam operator that have been doing it for some time um, glide cams are also usually cheaper than gimbals because gimbals are uh, motorized and they tend to have a bit more functions that do different types of things so they are a bit more complex in glide cams alone, but glide cams can still be a little pricey. They can go to, I think, a few thousand dollars. Um, most of them are within the few hundred range, I believe, but I believe there are some um, higher end ones that go into a few thousand once you start getting higher and higher in quality and um, functionality. Yeah, I would think like if you're running like a decent amount of like film stuff all the time you'd probably want like a ten thousand dollar setup if you're like that's if you're shooting like a ton of videos if you're doing like the odd like miniature setup probably a lot less but mm -hmm. i'm saying thinking if you're doing features on an independent level you could probably pull that off but yeah yeah right because like you have to think it also has to be able to like have the battery capacity to like run for like all day long every day and with a gimbal hmm? Are you talking about with a gimbal? Well, just like in general, like, so I'm not saying on one piece of equipment, but like, say you were like, hey, we're going to start up like our own independent company and we're going to be shooting a bunch of videos and having clientele and stuff, then you'd want to have like a decent amount of um, equipment to start. So you, it's like when you do like business investment, then you'd be like, okay, this is the, you know, the stash of like equipment that you need to have and then everything else you could rent and then you'll be doing whatever client work. Oh yeah, I agree. Like you yeah. need to have like the basics and then and rent out yeah, the rest if you're doing that. it all the time. Because you're not really gonna need every piece of it. Like you might not need a stabilizer every single time you do anything because you might just have tripod shots, you might have jib shots. So you might not need the stabilizer for that shoot. So sometimes it might be better if you don't use it all the time or if you're not going to, um, to rent a piece of gear like that, especially if you're looking more towards the more expensive stuff and the higher end gear then renting oh, might definitely. be a better option. Some I, I people say, oh, sorry, what? Yeah, I say it like it really comes down to like usage as well. Like, so if you have like your own setup, you want to get all the equipment that you're using most of the time and then renting any specialized equipment. They even do that on the higher scale, like on like studio stuff they have, they own obviously a lot of the studio equipment and then they rent in the specialized equipment. It doesn't make mm -hmm. sense for them to like, you're full working on a five month movie. We have a month off, then we have another six month movie. It does not make sense to like rent that all of the equipment. They're going to have all of the basics. It's going to be owned by studio. And then they're just going to bring in like specialized cranes and specialized cameras and mm -hmm. lenses for specific shots. They're not yeah. going to be, yeah. I mean, yeah, it doesn't make specific sense. shoots and things like that. Because yeah, it doesn't make sense that. to like rent all of the lights. It's like, okay, you have like your light set and then you rent out if you need like a special light or whatever right yeah. all right so with gimbals and things like that some people say gimbals are easier to begin with because they don't have as big of a learning curve from the start but they're harder to master whereas glide cams they're harder to begin with they have a little bit more of a learning curve to get it right to get it steady get good shots with it anyway um, but they're easier to master. So they're easier to um, figure out completely once you get the hang of it. But the gimbals are the opposite. They're a bit easier to figure out from the start, but then they're a lot harder to get to master and get like professional with. Gimbals usually take more time to calibrate and to get ready than glide cams on set as well because they have mechanized motor. I mean, they have a motorized 
motors and electronics and you have to balance these things and you have to balance glide cams as well but they do tend to be a bit easier to set up and to balance than the the gimbals especially if you have a five axis gimbal then you have to balance it for five different axes axes whereas if you have a two two axis glide cam or a three axis glide cam you only have to do it for two or three there are two and three axis gimbals as well. So the, the higher up you get with that, the, the, more you're, the more time you're going to need in the beginning to balance it for all of those different movement types. Um, sometimes with gimbals footage, it can have a weird kind of mechanical feeling, like a kind of like jolts or stutters a bit whenever it is doing any kind of movement. Whereas glide cams, they'll have smoother pans and tilts, but also will add a bit more motion, similar, similar to a point to handheld, but a lot smoother. So I actually have a, this image. This is the glide cam footage. And you can see if you look at the top left corner while he's walking, you can see the movement, you can feel him walking. Um, so the movement is kind of expressed in the frame itself as well. And pe some people like this, some people don't. And um, when you are using these, typically what people try to do is they try to do what's called like a ninja walk, where they are very, um, they're trying not to move their feet too much. They're trying to stay kind of lower to the ground by bending their knees just slightly and staying the same so that they're not constantly bobbing up and down and creating these different jerky movements that can sometimes be expressed with the glide cam footage um, like you're seeing here where he's moving towards the guy he's moving around and you can see the edges the corners of that frame are bobbing back and forth they're kind of like a seesaw kind of movement because every step he takes it's going to be bobbing in a different direction so gimbals will usually adjust for that, um, for these types of movements, but they, they do have a bit of a jerky look to them. So if you're looking at a gimbal, it's not really jerky in this, but um, you can see that when he's doing the movement, it takes a little bit of time. Well, not right now, once you see the camera, like when you see him moving, the, he's moving the, um, the gimbal, and then the gimbal reacts to his movement. So it does have a little bit of a um, time before it, it's not instantaneous like it is on a glide cam or a steady cam. It has a bit of a lag to the movement. So when he's moving it to the left or when he's bobbing it up and down, um, you can see that it does take a little, a second for the camera to follow suit. So he's moving it and then the camera reacts right then. So when you're using a, a gimbal, and I'm sure there's newer ones and different ones that might react a bit faster or a bit slower, depending on the brand and the kind they are, um, as well as how they balanced it. It could be operator error that didn't balance it properly in the beginning. So it is having a bit harder time to figure out everything. So there are some human error that can go into it. But what I've heard from gimbals is that sometimes the, the footage can look a little jerky because it takes a moment for that camera to follow. So it does look very um, mechanized where all of a sudden there's movement and then it stops and then it goes up again because the person can't do as fluid of a movement because the camera's not following yet. So it is a bit harder to operate for panning and tilting and different movement like that. Now for for steady movement, for walking towards the subject while keeping it steady and not having things shake, gimbals are preferred because they're not gonna have really as much bobbing up and down as a glide cam would. They're not gonna have as much of that movement like you saw in the previous um, example. They are going to be a bit more steady and stable and have the image looking good. But if you're trying to do tilting and panning and different movements like that, a gimbal can start to look a bit more mechanized. They can look more like a robot doing it because 
it is harder to operate because the camera is, is reacting a little, just a slight second, fraction of a second slower than the movement that you are doing. It's not as instantaneous as a steady cam, glide cam, or any kind of um, mechanical manual stabilizer. Also with gimbals, some people say <clears throat> that they can feel a bit too locked off, like there's absolutely no movement to them at all. And so even in Hollywood films, when they have steady cam operators, they sometimes try to add a tiny bit of movement, even if it's ever so slight, just to give it a little bit more of a different feel to it. So um, some people say, you know, gimbals, especially for certain type of shots, like a bunch of action shots and things like that. Sometimes they can be a bit too locked off. Sometimes they can stay a bit too steady and it just doesn't work as well as having just a slight bit of movement, giving it more of a human feel. Um, but that's, you know, subjective and some people love it. Some people don't like it as much and some people love it for certain shots and hate it for others so it just really depends on what your preferences are and what you prefer whenever you are or what you're shooting what your project is and what is happening in the scene or the shot with any of these systems most of them will allow you to get a separate vest system that makes it, again, it kind of looks more like a steady cam at that point. The arms that are attached to the vest for the cheaper models usually aren't as complex and don't adjust for that bobbing up and down as well as a steady cam might, but they do um, distribute the weight a little better. So they, they um, whenever you're holding a, let me see. I have one. So if, if she didn't have this vest and she's just holding this glide cam, then eventually your arms will get tired, your shoulders will get tired. And, you know, even with your wearing of the vest, you, that's probably still going to happen. But because she's wearing that vest, because the arm is there, it's helping, it's helping distribute the weight a little bit, taking it off from just her arms, just her shoulders to where she can operate it for longer without getting tired, without having to take a break. So those vests help with that. And then because they have that arm, it also helps to compensate for the bobbing up and down, the up and down vertical movement that you get from walking, that you get from breathing when you're holding a camera steady. And so a lot of that movement will go into that arm and it will be taken out of the framing from the, from the actual camera. So you won't notice it as much. It'll, it'll stabilize it a bit better. And there are different brands to do this. Some are, you know, this is a glide cam brand vest. I believe the last one was fly cam. So that's like the uh, off, well, I wouldn't say off brand, but that's an alternate brand to a glide cam that does similar things for cheaper. Um, <clears throat> and so different brands will have different vests and they'll have different types of arms and some are gonna work better than others but there are those options out there, not just for steady camps. From um, YC Imaging, this is letter E in the syllabus. Oh, let me see, where is E? What's the best stabilizer gimbal for you? He says, um, get glide cams, work better with some weight on the top. With a light camera, you're going to get a lot more sway. So he says that, you know, whatever the payload is, a, a heavier camera towards that payload um, is going to work a little bit better, in his opinion, than lighter cameras, because lighter cameras can be shoved around a lot more. And those systems are, those stabilizers, they're made for a little bit more weight to balance correctly. So. Um, having a lighter camera makes it a bit harder for everything to balance right because they're not made, some are not made for as light of camera. So you really want to look into the payload, not just so you make sure that it can hold your camera and it can function properly, but also to make sure that you're not putting a too light of a camera 
on a system that is supposed to hold much heavier ones because it's gonna be better suited and easier to balance with the heavier camera because it was made with those in mind. So there's different ones. Some are made for mobile phones now. Some are made for mirrorless cameras, like I said, DSLRs, cinema cameras. And so you really need to make sure that you're not getting one that is over your budget and not over your budget, but like too expensive to the point where it's going to be made for cameras that you don't own because you own a cheaper camera or that you are making sure to get one that is going to be able to hold your camera, depending on how much it weighs with all its accessories, you need to make sure it's going to be able to hold it properly without malfunctioning or breaking your uh, stabilizer. And then from Momentum Productions, video glide cam or gimbal, which is better. He says, with a gimbal, it's a lot easier to attach accessories like a follow focus, a monitor, other electronic devices, because you can kind of just plug it in. Certain gimbals will allow you to just plug it into the gimbal itself because they are themselves electronic. So they can function with a lot of other electronics a lot better than um, glide cams can because glide cams don't have electronics in them. So you have to do external electronics and that's batteries and other things. And it makes it a bit harder um, to attach all of those things like a monitor and a follow focus because you have to have the batteries for them and you have to have them plugged in somewhere. And um, it kind of, throws the balance off a bit, depending on what kind of glide cam you have. You might have too much weight going to the right or the left, and then you have to counterbalance for that, but the glide cam wasn't really made for that kind of weight. And so now with all the accessories and all these other electronic attachments and accessories, you are putting it over its payload, or you're just, it's not made to have that much weight going to the right because they weren't expecting you to have a monitor off to the side. Whatever the case may be, um, he was just saying that, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to, if you're using a lot of those electronic accessories, glide, uh, not glide cam, gimbals are a lot easier to use because they can plug everything into them for, the, well, depending on which one you get. So you also, you also have to check if you are planning to do that, do your research, make sure you're getting one that allows you to connect those accessories to it before buying it. With the VEST systems, there's also this thing called an easy rig, which is basically like a backpack VEST system that has a sort of like a fishing pole that goes over it, which holds the camera. So you can use it with just a handheld camera, or you can use it with a gimbal, and it will help stabilize and put a little bit more weight on your whole body compared to just your arms. So it's a bit cheaper, I believe, than like the systems like these. And um, it, it helps to distribute the weight. So you're not putting it all in the front of you on your, on your arms and your uh, forearms and biceps. It's distributing evenly to your waist and your, and your chest and all that. That's it from the back. And you can see it has this big, huge like pole that goes up and then kind of like a little crane. And then like a little fishing pole that has a little line that goes and connects to either the camera or the gimbal to help uh, hold it up so that you're not doing it all yourself. Like I already said, gimbals have the more handheld ones. This is the um, Crane 2S. And then it has the more complex, larger ones. This, I believe, is the um, Ronin 2. I think it's the Ronin Crane 2. Uh, <clears throat> And this one, I think, is a five-axis one. Those, you see the little bars that are stretching from the, the middle. If he moves up and down, those are trying to compensate for that movement so that there's not that much bobbing. Because that is an issue. If you look at any footage from a, from a gimbal, that can be an issue with the bobbing up and down when people walk. Even if they're trying to walk silently, you know, doing that ninja walk, some of that movement still gets seen in the camera and the frame. And sometimes it can look very cheap and 
not very uh, high quality. So it depends on if you want that or not, but it's always good to keep that in mind and just always check out the footage too. In the syllabus, you can see they, they compare footage from a gimbal to a, to a glide cam, steady cam to a glide cam, steady cam to a gimbal and all that. So you can also just look that up on YouTube if you wanna look up a specific one and how it handles because it also depends on how the operator was doing it. Again, there is some operator error there because if they're not walking correctly, if they're not holding it right, and especially if they didn't balance it correctly, it's not going to be as uh, smooth and as stable as it would be if somebody who is more experienced and did it right, walked right and operated it correctly were using it. So you have to keep that in mind as well look up different ones. If you're planning to buy a specific one, I would say look up a few different people using it to make sure that the footage looks similar, if not the same, in all three of them so you know what you're getting into. You just look up one operator, they might not be using it well, or they might be a professional with it, uh, and your footage won't turn out like theirs anytime soon until you use it for years. And then you have like the Ronin 2 which uh, is just like a different kind. It has this huge, um, I don't know what to call that, but basically you'll hold it from both sides. You can hold it from above and things like that so that the gimbal stays in the middle. And so there's different kinds, different um, sizes and they support different weights. So you have to just check and see which one you, you would want. Going back to the vest, um, gear and things like that there's something called a combination rig which is basically like a vest that has a sort of it's kind of like the easy rig in a way but it has it's more robust it has larger poles and it can make it be more of a um, crane arm as well as the gimbal so that way you are controlling it from down where you, you know, right, right where your body is, where your chest is, but the camera can be raised higher or lower depending on what kind of combination rig you have. Combination being the gimbal and the attachment to the vest that is allowing it to be in a certain area like above his head. This is for the Ronin 2 that has a specific vest for it where you can see the little straps You'll hold it, you'll strap it. And this one is more for helping to balance it, helping to distribute the weight. So there are different kinds and they're for different uses. So again, if you're looking up something like that, you wanna be sure you know what you're getting and just check and see what it does, what it's for. Some are more for distributing the weight so that you're not holding that thing and getting tired. Some are for stabilization and helping to stabilize it from different movement types. And some are, for um, using it as a, you know, being able to raise it up, lower it down and do different movements that you couldn't do with just your hands. Uh, one second. Oh, and, then, and then we have a, what's called a hybrid model of a gimbal and a steady cam. So basically what it is, it's the steady cam with a gimbal attached to the end. And what this does is it gives the best of both. So it still has, people use steady cams again because it has a bit more of a human feel. It's very smooth and steady, but when you want to add movement, you can. Whereas gimbals, they either have too much movement with bobbing up and down, with walking and things like that, or they're too locked off where they're correcting every kind of movement. So when you want to add a tiny bit of movement, it's really hard to do and it doesn't work out as well. So what a steady cam and a gimbal will do is try to adjust for both and give you the best of both worlds, but those, you're using both systems, so it also comes with both cons. So um, take that as you will. There's not many people that can use them because they are a lot more complex. They're a lot more expensive and they are pretty hard to use, but I'm sure in the coming years we'll have more brands and more types come out cheaper and, and more for the consumer model. Right now, I would say these types are made more for a professional use case because they are a, you know, a steady cam is already hard to use. Uh, gimbals already take some time to use. Combining them both 
Like that's just added complexity. So even if, especially if you don't know either one, using both at the same time is, is gonna be a lot more difficult. And then with gimbals, all sorts, you have the simpler and easier ones that maybe can, they can set up a lot easier. And then you have the more complex ones that will be more difficult to set up and get ready. So when you are out shopping, if you're trying to get a gimbal, if you want a motorized one, just know what kind you're getting and check and see how long it's gonna to take to set that thing up. Because some are a lot more complicated to set up than others. Some are very simple and you just, you know, you, you set your camera, you do a few things and it might take a few minutes. Other ones are a lot more complex and there's a lot more things you have to do and adjust. And they don't have as many indicators to let you know like um, how precise the movement you're doing is. So you don't really know how much further or how much less to adjust it so that it balances correctly. While others will have markers and indicators on the device itself that shows like how much you've moved it you know, just like little lines on the side, which you can like look at and see kind of like if you were looking at a ruler and that way you can make small increment changes until you get it balanced correctly. And it can help to speed up the process of uh, not over correcting it, which will help you to balance it faster. But also the usually um, with the more complex ones, you will have more functions. So it really depends on what you wanna do with it when you get it, because some will be a lot more complex, but they'll have a lot more functionality to them and a lot more options, like controlling it from your phone, uh, remote controlling it from a different controller and just pressing a button and letting the camera do certain, or letting the uh, gimbal do its work, while others will be a lot more simple and only allow you to balance it and just use it to balance it and, or unbalance certain certain parts when you want. Um, so with gimbals, the last things you wanna make sure you check out is, well, first of all, like I already said, make sure your camera's compatible with it. Certain gimbals, because they're electronic, some are made specifically for certain cameras, certain brands. So you wanna be sure that you are getting one that is going to work with your camera um, because they're not all made for the same types of cameras. Some are made specifically with one camera brand in mind. Usually that's not the case, but sometimes it is. So you wanna be, be sure to check it out, make sure that it's compatible. So the weight, and all of that, but also that it's just compatible with your, with your camera in the first place. Um, also with, with gimbals, when you're looking up reviews, when you're looking up information about it, some of them are going to have bad reviews, but that could just be because the reviewer was using an incompatible camera with it, or they didn't balance it correctly. So you can't automatically trust reviews like if you're going to go buy one on Amazon for instance you can't just automatically trust the reviews of it even if it only has three stars because a lot of the reviewers might just be people who are inexperienced and are using it incorrectly or with the wrong kind of camera or they're just giving it a bad review because it doesn't work with their camera even though they didn't check to see beforehand if it was compatible or not so that's why you know YouTube reviews and things like that to see if the people know what they're talking about sometimes a bit better than just trusting the ones posted online. You also want to consider the battery type and how long the battery lasts. You know, how long does it last? Is it external battery or is it internal? Can I not take it out or will I be able to replace it and get extra batteries? Some of them have it built in to where you can charge it directly into the device which is a pro and a con because it doesn't have an extra piece, but also you can't just change out the battery if you need to. So you can't have extra battery. So that thing needs to last as long as you're trying to shoot for. And others will have external batteries, which you can get, you know, additional batteries have them pre-charged and whatever else. So you have as many as you need. 
And then what kind of accessory attachments can it have? Uh, what kind of wireless connectivity will it have? Like I said, with the remote control or with connecting it to an app from your phone so you can control it from your phone. Then you want to think about how, um, look up how quiet it is. Some of them are made to be very silent while they're moving and others are going to be a lot louder because of the parts they're made out of and how they're made. They just, they make more noise when they're moving. They have little motors inside of them working, adjusting the movements back and forth as you move. So every time that happens, those things will make noise. And depending on how it's made, it'll make either more or less noise than other um, other brands or other versions of gimbals. And then you just want to see if you can change the stabilization modes. You know, that's like if you can change it to allow for a certain mode easily, simply by a press of a button, or do you have to actually manually um, adjust it so that it doesn't try to balance for that certain movement anymore? Those are things you want to look up and see before buying one if you're trying to get a gimbal because they're, they're all, you know, again, they are electronic, so they have a lot of different functionality to them, and the different ones will be made for different cases and different uses. So depending on what you're trying to use it for, they might not really be suited to your type of filming. We're talking about filmmaking here, so that, that gimbal might be made for more of a reality or live performance kind of shoot and not really made for a feature film or a narrative project. And so different ones will be for different things. You wanna just look up, do your research if you're gonna get one. But those are the differences between them and what you kinda of wanna look out for. Um, last thing I was gonna mention, so some brands like Glidecams that you'll find, of course, Glidecam, it's the main brand that most people know, Flycam, Came TV, newer, actually has one that's a bit really cheap. So I'm not really sure how good it is, but they do have handheld stabilizers that are similar in uh, shape and size to the glide cams, fly cams, and all them. And then you, I think it's Elango, Elangu. And then some brands for gimbals you'll find is the DJI Ronin. People love that one. Ronin 2, Ronin Crane. Uh, that's probably the main one out there. And then I would say Free Fly Movie or Movie is the next one, the next uh, most popular. Then there's, uh, I think it's Zayun, Moza, Fayutech, and Digital Photo. So if you're looking for a gimbal or you're looking for a glide cam or a glide cam alternative, then uh, those are some of the brands you'll come across. With, with steady cams, there are different brands, but it was harder to find. So I didn't really try i mean there was like basin or basin for one of them and then steadicam because it's its own brand other than that i couldn't really find any uh, other brands on them and that's mostly because they are just more for the professional use case so you'll you'll know what you're trying to get by the time you want to get one for the most part uh, which is why there's not too much information about them out there all right, does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about uh, glide cams, gimbals, steady cams? Steady cams. Um, yeah. So I know for, for steady cam, like you had said, the information you were looking for wasn't there because it's more of a elite, I guess. I, I want to use that word elite. But um, yeah, there. They're not as expensive as they used to be because now you have all these um, smaller brands that are coming out with their own little setup that is similar to it, which is good. Um, but there, it's still now, I think they still have it where um, you need to be certified to use it or something like that. Like I think there's like a course you take or something because I, I have a buddy who got certified on it and went to California. So you can make a lot of money with it. Like... Um, if that's what you want to do but um yeah that that's why with that um let's see the ronins and the gimbals those are cool like you were saying with the um what do you call it the uh the, the little 
uh, robotic shake and stuff. It does it does do that like a lot of times when the batteries is low or just the calibration isn't right. Cause there's, there's just a lot, or maybe it's just like overworked and overheating. Mm-hmm. They'll do that sometimes. But um, uh, I just want to say for, for those, cause I see a lot of people get them and they have like these high expectations for using them, which is, is cool. But um, even though you still get them, it's still, you're still going to have to like work it and get some experience with it. It's just not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to wave it around like a wand and it's going to like handle everything. You have to learn how to, um, you have to, you have to learn how it's going to handle each movement. Like once you understand how it works, then like you will get way more better shots than if you were just like, oh, you know, it's just going to handle everything. You understand like what it's doing and then how it's going to react to certain things then you go because at the, at the end of the day it's it's still hit or miss with those things like sometimes you'll get really usable shots and um other times you might not just you know because um not only that but they even with mirrorless cameras and the lighter cameras they still get kind of heavy on the heavy side um so finding you know getting the whole rigged out one with the vest the arm um that's still that's cool and too uh, but at the same time you you're still gonna have to um bring that with you um so like it's it's a it's a whole in in my opinion i think it deserves a whole nother a, a whole completely separate department because um it takes a long time to set that stuff up the vest the whole the arm and the vest and all that stuff it takes a really long time and it comes in its own case and its own rigged out and um i notice a lot of people like um they'll spend so so if you're like if you're like me like one of those one man band type things like i just don't have time for that because you know i got to worry about lights and all that other stuff so to add that to it it's like a whole nother, you know, it's a whole nother step that I got to, not even a step, like a whole nother series of steps I got to go through to get this thing, you know, just for that, after I get my light set up and everything to the way I want it to. Um, yeah. yeah. So a, a lot of times I've been on a lot of sets with like some, some peers of mine and some, you know, people I went to school with and they'll just hire somebody um, to do the camera work not that not, they won't you know they'll be like i'm the i'm the dp but we'll hire this guy to do the, all the camera work because he's got the uh the study cam and you know he he'll and and that's what he'll show up and he'll just that's all he does is he, he just worries about his stuff and then like me and then you know donovan who's the dp he'll worry about all the lighting and all all the fixtures and stuff like that that's mm-hmm. normally how we operate um yeah, so I, I really wouldn't recommend it for for somebody who's like, you know, the one, you know, the one man band. Or if you're doing a lot of like um you know, one one set of gigs where you're doing like, you know, documentaries or something like that where you're not doing too much, where you're doing a lot of talking heads, like I, I wouldn't recommend it for that. But you know, music videos is perfect for music videos. It's per- perfect for, you know, live events and stuff like that. But slower paced things like news and all that stuff. Um, it's good to have around if you're doing narrative stuff sometimes. Because I, I do notice, um, like, even the older movies, like, have a lot of steady cam stuff. But, like, I wouldn't rely too much of it. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is this, like, you know don't really harp on I know the idea is to get it to be like smooth and like shake free but like some people take it too far and they try (laughs) too hard to make it like perfect because if you go back and if you go back and you watch some of the most like uh just just watch some of these movies now and like I notice a lot of imperfections and and some of their you know, study cam work, and I'm like, oh, they let that slide, you know what I mean? So, like, I just hate going on set, and there's always, you know, the one guy that's trying extremely too hard. Like, they'll do a take, and I'm like, oh, that's a good take, but he'll, oh, no, there's a little bit of shake towards the end, and I'm like, gosh, like, could just <laughs> either, 
you know what I mean? Like some people think like the smallest insignificant shake, like would just all we got to do the whole take it over again. I, I shook and it's just like, man, like, you know, I'm, not, I'm all good. I'm all for getting the perfect shot, but not to that extreme where we're doing like a hundred takes just because, you know, the thing isn't doing right. You know, right. Some the point, other thing you, gotta, you could do, is if you're, especially if you're shooting 4K or 6K, is like just stabilize it in post if it's not too exactly. Much. That that's where I was. That's where I'm getting. That. And I hate I hate to be the guy that oh let's fix it in post. I hate to be that guy, but it's a it's two parts to it. There's what you're doing on on the production, and then there's post. So you got to kind of give your post a little bit of credit, and just have an idea of like what you're capable of and what what will be able to what wrinkles you'll be able to flatten out, you know, in in post. Yeah, because uh, the other thing about the time it. thing is like production days you know getting the actual footage that you need getting the coverage getting the extra exactly. shot choice the alternative that you didn't initially think you would get to but you did but if somebody's too focused on one thing it's wasting the whole day and then you might have to do another production day which is you know upping the costs and everything so there is definitely more to it uh i would say you know that whole like fix it in post Certain things can definitely be fixed in post. Don't rely on it, but don't think that it can't be done either. That's what I'd say. All right. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to mention is just um, on Thursday, we're just going to be watching everybody's second ex editing exercise and the um, color grading image. We're just going to look over those. And that's all we have for Thursday. Um, and so obviously those are, that's when those two exercises are due. So if you're trying to have everybody look at them, those are when they're needed to be done. And then uh, that's it for the, for the studies. And then we're going to review and do like a quiz and fill in the blanks like we do every semester next week. So yeah, that was everything. Awesome. That was a, another great um, day and uh, yeah, looking forward to like everything.